scientific systems, exact results, and we also have 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so what we are, have been trying to do is to use uh, integrable models where exact solutions are known to look at uh, mesoscopic systems. And I will describe uh, the motivation for that briefly, but not in words, but rather in pictures. We have already seen uh, this uh, picture before in the talk of Joseph Imri. So this is, base, is kind of a hallmark uh, system for mesoscopic physics, where you can uh, discuss the persistent currents. And what we want to do now is to put quantum impurities uh, in or next to such a ring. And I will mostly concentrate on the lower picture, it's, uh, kind of a cartoon picture, of a quantum dot which is side coupled to a metallic ring. And the metallic ring is pierced by a magnetic flux. If, I, if time allows, I will maybe say a few words also about the other system where we simply have a weak junction or a constriction in our model. So I don't have to remind you that uh, a flux translates into twisted boundary conditions. Actually, I can make use now of lots and lots of my previous speakers uh, who already pointed out all the results I need to put together uh, in order to describe my system. Uh, I can also skip basically the historical remarks, just reminding you that in this business, theory was quite well ahead of the experimental possibilities. Again, uh, just to get a sort of a baseline, I will re remind you of the persistent current of free electrons, but again, not in f the form of formulas, of equations, but rather as pictures. You see the typical uh, picture the sawtooth behavior of the persistent current as a function of magnetic flux. Uh, now, my the previous speaker, Sergio, also told you a lot about the Kondo effect, so I can be pretty brief here as well. Uh, you know the Kondo effect was discovered 30 years before it was actually named, uh, and people were puzzled how this resistance uh, minimum actually comes about in what they thought was perfectly non-metallic materials, uh, non-magnetic metals, excuse me, non-magnetic metals. And uh, only further experiments in the 60s showed that these metals were not so pure after all, that there were magnetic impurities. And then uh, Yun Kondo, whose picture you see here, could come up with a theoretical picture uh, which I will dwell on a little bit on the next slides. This is not the end of the story of the Kondo effect as far as theory is concerned because um, the Kondo effect is a typical non-perturbative effect and so it was on the agenda of theoreticians for quite a long time. And then in the beginning of the 80s, uh, the randomization group was one successful approach to the condo problem, but it was also uh, uh, discovered that you can use the beta ansatz method, which also is a very old method devised by Hans Bethe in 1931, uh, and it was applied to this particular problem. And I'm not going to talk about conformal field theory, which is yet another technique uh, to deal with the condo effect. Uh, from this slide, I actually just used this, the lowest uh, equation, giving you the Hamiltonian or reminding you of the Hamiltonian. But since you have seen it just a few minutes earlier by Sergio, so thanks to you, <laughs> uh, I can be very brief here. We have three electrons. We have a localized electron with a localized spin. We have especially coupling between localized and free electrons. Uh, one particular feature of the Kondo effect, which as far as I could make out, has not been 
discussed so far uh, has, is the Condor screening cloud. Namely, that's this, the picture, and I, I point that out because that may give some more motivation for our studies. The Condor screening cloud is actually the picture where you, uh, if you are at sufficiently low temperatures, low means on the uh, scale of the condo temperature, which was also defined by Sergio, then the electrons of the leads or of the magnetic, uh, of the non-magnetic metal host uh, will scatter and will form a cloud of correlated electrons around the magnetic impurity, around the condo impurity, and this is what is called the condo screening cloud. Now this is a picture uh, which again uh, shows what Sergio explained just a uh, short while ago. So again, for, I just point out that the Kondo effect in quantum dots is uh, the model of choice is again the Anderson impurity model and that will be the model where we will start with. But we have to do a few things in order to make a, an integrable model out of this. Now, from the historical remarks to condo in dots, let me just point out that the condo screening cloud, the object I just described to you, this many-body object, uh, is still sort of not really pinned down experimentally. So people would want, of course, to have some way of seeing this condo screening cloud. You cannot just postulate there is a cloud and not seeing it. Um, so one way may be, and that is one of the motivations for studies of this kind, uh, is to look at the persistent current in, a, in the system I'm introducing to you right now. And there is quite for a long time, there is conflicting uh, theoretical work. But unfortunately, because it's a rather delicate system, there is also no experimental work on that yet. So let me pause for a brief moment. This is now really the, the system I want to discuss. A ring, a side-coupled quantum dot. Side-coupled, of course, especially means once you cut the interaction between the dot and the ring, the ring itself remains intact. You could imagine other situations where you put the dot right into the ring, and then, of course, if you sort of cut out with scissors uh, the dot, then you also destroy the ring because then it's an open system. But that we won't discuss, or I won't discuss in this talk. Below here, there's a slightly more elaborate uh, experimental proposal uh, by Markus Bütiger and Charles Stafford for this situation. Now, the theoretical activity so far falls into broadly two classes. Namely, some people say the persistent current is strongly affected in such a way that the persistent current actually vanishes when the circumference of the ring becomes larger than the coherence length of the condor screening cloud. This is sort of one uh, school of thought and several groups have found this result with their methods. However, there's uh, work which basically postulates the opposite or finds the opposite, uh, and that includes our work using integrable model and the beta ansatz, and we say the persistent current is actually unaffected. Uh, again, uh, this is to remind you Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing quite well. Well, I have all this help from my friends, so I, I, I'm in a good shape, actually. <laughs> so, we, we, as I said, we start from the Anderson Hamiltonian, but then we ma map it onto a condo model by a Schrieffer-Wolf transformation. So we have here a Hamiltonian of, in real space, uh, and this Hamiltonian holds true in this uh, regime where we especially have, as we need for uh, seeing the condo effect, where we have one uh, 
where we have the level uh, of the magnetic impurity just uh, occupied by one. There was some more. Okay, so this is the uh, Hamiltonian which we have to further massage in order to get a really integrable model. This is not an integrable Hamiltonian, but we can do several, in several steps, we can uh, make it into an integrable model. First, we say the essential physics is actually confined to a small region around the left and right Fermi points, so we can linearize the spectrum, go sort of from a non-relativistic Hamiltonian, if you like, to a relativistic Hamiltonian, and in, we have to introduce left and right moving electron fields, and these fields we can further transform into the so-called wild basis, which is a basis of definite parity fields, so we have even parity right-moving electrons and odd parity left-moving electrons. And now things seem to be very nice because in this basis the Hamiltonian can just be written as the free Hamiltonian of free, or the Hamiltonian of free relativistic electrons in the odd channel, plus uh, an even part of the Hamiltonian, which consists of free electrons, again relativistic electrons, plus the condo impurity uh, interaction term. So this would be very nice, so we would have uh, the chiral Hamiltonian of the spin one-half condo model and we would, could relax and say, well, nice, we have solved the problem. However, uh, you remember that I flashed the slide where I was talking about uh, boundary conditions and we have, of course, to do the same steps with the boundary conditions and if you do that you see that the boundary conditions actually couple back the even and odd electron channels so it's a rather interesting uh, situation we have a completely decoupled Hamiltonian but the even and odd channels are cup in, in, on the level of the Hamiltonian it's decoupled but it's coupled back by the by the twisted boundary conditions. This is true except, of course, when we can make the off-diagonal element zero for special values. So for special values now, we really uh, can use the known results of the beta ansatz method. The only further ingredient which is connected to the fact that we have relativistic electrons is that we have to be very careful how to count the charge carriers. So this is sort of the way we have to count the charge carriers which go, uh, which are sort of driven off balance due to the Aharonov-Bohm flux. Or more generally the Aharonov-Bohm plus Aharonov-Kasher flux. And these quantities, these momenta, are uh, the quantities which are accessible via the beta ansatz wave function. So I don't have time to uh, give you all the details of beta ansatz, but the upshot is just that you get a set of coupled equation, equations which uh, give you the momenta of the charge degrees of freedom of a system and the spin degrees of freedom. So the charge degrees of freedom are uh, parameterized by the momenta k. The spin degrees of freedom are parameterized by the uh, parameters lambda. Usually these things are called rapidities, but this is just a technical term. And if you look at the first equation, uh, you will see in a moment, uh, with a moment's reflection, that this is just a very fancy way of writing the quantization condition 
for the momenta of free electrons. There is nothing more. However, in the, uh, this is true for the left moving electrons, for the right moving electrons, you have, all, you have to take into account all these scattering phases, and so you have a coupled set of equations. And the result uh, which we get from this analysis is, and I am now concentrating on the purely uh, Aharon of Bohm case, because the Aharon of Kasharev uh, case is not uh, in dispute. The purely Aharon of Bohm case, our result shows from the beta ansatz that we get the typical sawtooth behavior for the persistent current, and this is just the same as if the electrons, the free electrons in the ring, wouldn't see at all the magnetic impurity sitting in the ring. Now this has been uh, criticized and people suggested, Affleck and Simon especially suggested that this is due to our linearization, uh, which in turn uh, forces us to have this sort of non-standard definition of the persistent current. So just in order to check the likeliness, I mean, I can't, this, what I'm going to tell you now has not the character of a proof to the contrary, but we just wanted to look at an integrable model which does not do uh, this initial step of a linearization. We can do that, and here you see uh, there's an integrable model exactly solvable uh, with a quadratic spectrum. However, this, uh, well, integrable models are not just uh, here and there and everywhere. We, some models are integrables, others are not. And we have to massage this model uh, quite a bit in order to make it into an integrable model. Therefore, it's presumably not a very physical model. You won't find it sort of in nature. But just to investigate uh, this question of the quadratic spectrum, we use this. So the, the, the thing is that we have to have sort of uh, counter terms, which are local potentials, and we have a str strange dichotomy, uh, namely we have either repulsive electron-electron interactions and a ferromagnetic condo coupling or vice versa. And of course, what we would like to have would be repulsive electrons and uh, antiferromagnetic condo coupling. But this is just for the sake of having this uh, uh, solvable model. Now, again, we can use the beta ansatz to solve this system. If you've uh, encountered the beta ansatz before, you will see that those equations, apart from this term here, are the beta ansatz equations of the delta Fermi gas, which has been solved a long time ago by Yang. And you should note that, because this will play a major role in a moment, that the phase shifts have a definite par parity when you go from x to minus x. So now uh, there are a number of technical things which I will go over very quickly. We have to introduce a number of parameters uh, to parameterize the beta ansatz equations. And uh, then we perform a finite size analysis on the basis of the beta ansatz, but with a few more ingredients, which are here in the red box. And if we do that, then we will find that basically the persistent current of the system is given by the flux, of course, as, is, as we know, but also by contributions which correspond to shifting charge carriers from the left to the right Fermi point and also uh, spin degrees of freedom from the left to the right Fermi point. And now, uh, if we look very carefully and analyze our beta ansatz equations, we will see that we don't have, I mean, these quantities, dc and ds, are given by integral equations, which we would have to solve, but we don't. We actually just look at them and realize that the impurity contribution, which is written out here, the impurity contribution to these uh, parameters are exactly zero 
due to the symmetry of the beta ansatz equations. So that uh, gives me opportunity to conclude. We conclude that the beta ansatz uh, shows in our concrete model, and we could conjecture maybe also in other conceivable models uh, amenable to beta ansatz methods, uh, that the integrability actually protects the persistent current from integrable impurities. And this kind of protection uh, is not quite as unusual as it might seem. It has been uh, observed for other systems with impurities which, are, which have a beta ansatz solution before. And uh, I see our chairman, so I think I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Okay, so um, there's a bit of time for questions, please. Yeah, I, I was thinking, um, that with respect to the linearization of the first problem, in sort of how they look into liquid linearization, there are typically nonlinear terms that are typically scaled away. But here, because of the boundary conditions, they will not be scaled away. So I wonder whether you... Uh, see how you are interpreting Well, that, that's sort of a... a, a very p pertinent remark. Uh, of course, our, our uh, justification for the linearization comes from similar considerations as you mentioned. Um, uh, of course, in order to have this an integrable model, apart from looking at a, another model, as I showed you, uh, we have to be, stay strictly in the linear regime. If we add some non-linearities, the integrability is gone, and we cannot apply our method. So uh, the, the question really is how that translates into the boundary conditions, how that can be sort of found in the boundary conditions, and that we haven't, uh, we haven't considered. But it's a, it's a very good remark. OK. Just a short question, please, and a short answer, of course. Uh, okay. uh, okay. uh, so is this uh, protection uh, associated with uh, the fact that in an integrable model you have uh, conservation laws? So that's a. Uh, yeah, I mean. For the same reason, you wouldn't have any dissipation. You cannot have dissipation. In uh, yeah, you, you, you can formulate. It. Well, if you say integrability, that means that you have uh, conservation laws or you can say that you have a diffractionless system. And certainly this has to do uh, with this. But we, we wanted to make it sort of manifest in, in, a, in a model which we can calculate uh, through. But it certainly got to do with this. Okay, so then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.